This is a Frontline Club event recorded on the 18th of June 2020. Environment, Hope in Hell. A discussion with Jonathan Porritt, Bill McKibben and Nicole Tana. I am very, very happy to welcome our guests this evening. Uh, truly distinguished panelists, CVs studded with honours and accomplishments. Um, uh, Jonathan Porritt, CBE, uh, who has been at the nexus of politics and the environmental movement for more than four decades here in the UK. It's not a coincidence that this session is entitled Hope in Hell. That is the name of his new book. Um, and we'll be talking about that as well. He is a former director of Friends of the Earth. He was the head of the Labour Party's Sustainable Development Commission under Tony Blair. Um, and he's a longtime activist on climate change and advisor to both business and politicians. Jonathan, welcome. Bill McKibben, is a respected and hugely admired writer for The New Yorker on climate change, also a political activist. He drafted the Democratic Party document on the environment for Bernie Sanders. His first book, The End of Nature, back in 1989, was one of the earliest uh, really vociferous calls to action on climate change, well ahead of the curve, and since then he has been a beacon and a leader. He's written about all kinds of things, including endurance training and hiking, but he always returns to the central, monumentally important issue of the impact, our human impact on the, pl on the planet and how we can reorganize our lives and societies without destroying this, our terrestrial home. Bill, welcome to you. Good to be with you. And Nicole uh, Aitano, who is the executive director for TVE, TV for the Environment, until 2019. She worked for the World Wildlife Fund, and she too is an author of No Place Left to Bury the Dead, Denial, Despair, and Hope in the African AIDS Pandemic. Nicole, welcome. I'm going to begin by uh, asking you to give us my, your thoughts in a nutshell on the proposition that COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, the experience of it, uh, and its fallout around the globe, whether it, it, it's a pause that is going to affect environmental activism and policy going forward. In other words, does this mark a new beginning of some kind? Jonathan, take it away. It's already had a very big impact, obviously. It's stopped pretty much everything that had been building through 2019 and before that. And it's a pause button, which we haven't yet worked out the implications of, frankly. It could go either way, genuinely. I can't remember an inflection point quite as telling as this one in you know, a long sustainability career, because the consequences of getting it right or getting it wrong over the course of the next 18 months are just un unbelievable. If we get it right, and the $10 trillion, that's what the latest estimate is, $10 trillion of recovery spend um, in our economies around the world, will seek to get economies back on their feet, restore purchasing power, create jobs, do everything that you'd expect governments to do at a time of unbelievable, unprecedented crisis. If we get it right, and we simultaneously address the climate emergency, collapsing ecosystems, just unbelievable deficits on social justice, uh, racial equality, and so on. If we get that right, then it sets us up pretty nicely for the ways in which we could get to 2030 feeling relatively hopeful about a stable future for humankind. If we get it wrong, and that's at least as likely as getting it right, then the consequences for humankind are almost unspeakable. And for young people in particular, who I think we all need to keep in our minds when we try and work out what it is that needs to happen over the course of the next three, four, six months, because that's the, that's the decisive period of time. So I don't remember a, a, a period in, in my life where the consequences of, of a bifurcating path are graver. We either sort this and do it well, or we don't, in which case, hope, and we've all written about hope, and I want to recognize that. Bill's wonderful book, Falter, was a huge influence on me as I was writing Hope in Hell, and I, I know Nicole's book is, I love that 
subtitle because it goes to the heart of it, not just hope and despair, but also denial, of which there is an awful lot still in our lives. So we're all interested in this hope story, but how do you do hope authentically at a time when the converging crises seek to strip it away from all of our lives every day? Bill. Well, Elizabeth, first of all, thank you for asking me. Nicole, what a pleasure to get to join you on this panel. Jonathan, congratulations on the book, and thank you for a long life of really hard work that's helped get us to the point where we are now. You'll forgive me if today I'm not quite as gloomy as I usually am. <laughs> just, got the, just got the news uh, two hours ago that, uh, that the Vatican had joined in the call for fossil fuel divestment. Uh, this is a big milestone in this eight-year campaign that's become the biggest anti-corporate campaign in history. We're at $14 trillion now in institutions that have joined in. Um, and I think that that helps set the stage here. It reminds us that one of the things that's going to be decisive is where the zeitgeist is. Have we managed to move people's sense of what's normal and natural and obvious far enough that in a moment of crisis like this, we don't fall back on the old ideas of normal and instead we're able to see what's coming so clearly that we reach out for it. The COVID crisis should have taught us a couple of things. One, reality is real. Doesn't matter if the president of the United States, you know, declares it a hoax, the microbe doesn't care any more than the CO2 molecule uh, cares about where in the business cycle we are or anything else. Chemistry, physics, biology are non-negotiable. Second, it should remind us that speed matters. Some countries, not the US or the UK, figured out early on that flattening the curve required moving quickly. They spent February doing that. February in the climate story is the last 30 years, you know. Um, most countries have not figured out that we needed to move fast. So now we need to move extra fast. We need to compress what should have been 40 years of work into a decade, and it's going to be hard, and Jonathan's right, this is the last real opportunity to jumpstart that work and get it going at speed. Third and final thing, the COVID crisis is, should be a powerful shifting point in our understanding of politics. Uh, Jonathan and I spent most of our lives in the shadow of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher of the idea that markets solve all problems, of the idea that there is no such thing as a society, only individuals. What did Ronald Reagan, all, his laugh line was always, the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Ha, ha, ha. It turns out the scariest words in the English language are, we've run out of ventilators. Or maybe the hillside behind your house has caught on fire. Okay? You can't solve those those ways. Social solidarity is the only way we're going to come out of this moment in any kind of shape to make the changes that we need. This better be the kind of demarcation that Jonathan rightly says it could be. Bill, I know you're back. You dropped out just a little bit. And I'm having the end, but you, we I, got you. We got you, Bill. We got. We got it. Would you like to talk? <laughs> Yeah, no, it was good. Yeah, I think probably like everyone on this panel, I've oscillated in, in no. recent weeks and months between utter despair and a real sense of hopefulness. And on the positive side, I think, first of all, we need to look at what's happening now, both in the context of COVID-19, but also in the Black Lives Movement and the real um, huge mobilization on a global level of people around the world around social justice and uh, issues. And I think there's a real opportunity for us to reframe the environmental movement in a social justice way and to bring together these two narratives, the narrative about social justice and equality and distribution of resources and um, you know, how our society te teach, uh, treats the poorest um, along with the uh, environmental movement. And I think if we don't do that, though, we risk irrelevance for the environmental movement, because I think one of the things you've seen, you know, in the past few years, not just with Black Lives Matter, but also with uh, the kind of young people galvanizing the students who've gone to the streets over the environmental movement is that, you know, that the movement has become the, 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 the 
the momentum in the movement is coming from the more radical side of it. And there, there's a risk that the mainstream movement in the environmental space isn't thinking big enough, isn't thinking radically enough. And I think there's a real opportunity at the moment to re in the same way that Black Lives Matter has recentered, um, you know, what is possible to, to do that within the environmental movement. And I think uh, we need to think very hard about who are, you know, how we make that movement more inclusive. I think there's still a massive problem within the movement uh, about it not being inclusive. And, and Bill, I really recognize and appreciate the work you've done in that space, uh, particularly in, in the United States, um, but also make space for, for a broader spectrum of ideas, um, some of which will be more radical. Can I chip in there? I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, Nicole. I think that, um, it's it's been quite a wake up call a lot of environmentalists particularly i think here in the uk watching the story unfold in the us because oddly enough the us has always had a a much more influential environmental justice movement that bill has been very involved in than we have here in the uk we've never really had an environmental justice movement we've not suffered the same assaults on people of color as has happened in the usa we've not had the same sense that this uh, that the distribution of environmental damage is quite as pronounced as it has been in the UK and we've had very few NGOs out there really campaigning in a pronounced and consistent way for the connection between social justice and biophysical sustainability so for those people and organizations that have always campaigned for those two things being conjoined completely two sides of the same coin this has been another reminder that you can't you can't separate these two things they are absolutely critical and if we are going to make this the inflection moment the moment of real change then it's only by doing what you've just said which is combining those two absolutely critical non-negotiables into one social movement amen to that and it's really a pleasure to see how people are making those connections you know the horror the horror for minneapolis of watching a cop kneel on a guy's neck while he was saying, I can't breathe, was a reminder to a lot of people, and maybe some people an introduction to the fact that people in poor communities around the world can't breathe for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's because the police are pushing them down, and sometimes it's because that's where air pollution uh, in our world is, and sometimes it's because those are the people who, when confronted with the worst heat waves the world has ever seen, don't have access to air conditioning or anything like it, and so are out there somehow trying to cope with temperatures we've never seen before. It really is a moment when we're forced to confront the fact that if we can't, if we can't figure out how to be a more united people, we have no chance of dealing with this crisis because it's the first climate crisis is the first truly global thing we've ever seen and it's going to require the first truly global everyone on board response and i'll just say the very good news from the states is and this is something that I, i'm not sure everybody always knows but I, I keep trying to tell people i mean when we pull when people get when they pull people in the u.s the communities that care about climate change by far the most are latino american and african american communities by a huge margin and everyone's surprised to hear that. But in fact, you know, around the world, it's, you know, indigenous people and frontline communities that are leading this fight almost everywhere. Yeah. And yet, well, I would say, although, and that's true in the UK as well, all studies have shown, but very few of those people of color would label themselves environmentalists or would claim the mantle of being environmentalists. And I think that's a failure in many part ways of the movement and, and the way in which they have not felt included within that movement. And I think that has to do with the stories we tell and the language that we use. I think we coming from a scientific, you know, because the movement comes from mm. the science of understanding climate change and biodiversity loss, we often use that language, which doesn't necessarily resonate with all, all communities and frankly doesn't resonate particularly well in many communities. Well, that's why talking about justice is such a good idea. And, and it, I mean, I really do think that that's, that change in the zeitgeist that I've been talking about is very clear, at least in the US in the last three weeks around issues about race and policing. All of a sudden, it's 
open game on things that were completely undiscussable, weren't even on the agenda a month ago and now are. And, and I think that that's starting to be true around fossil fuel as well, um, that we're really beginning to understand that the future doesn't have to look like the past. And that's the most important conceptual leap. If we can get past that, we, we by this point have the technologies and things to, to, to do the work. We just need to be able to get past the point where it, we can't imagine and then demand that kind of change of the status quo. So Bill, I, I haven't heard you quite as um, chipper as it were, quite as uh, go for it, we can do this and we're gonna do it in the shortest possible period of time for quite, for quite a while. And I'm really heartened by that. I, I, I have my own barometer of hope and despair and, uh, and I'm sure we all do, but to actually hear you talk in these terms is really critical. I was listening to Christiana Figueres uh, last week simply saying it is the next 18 months that will determine whether or not we get to the point we need to be at from a climate biodiversity justice point of view by 2030 or not and and I thought that that compacting of time bringing it right into our lives now in the next 18 months is critical of course right in the middle of that 18 months we have a rather important election and I don't want to spoil the party this early in proceedings but bloody hell I mean a lot swings on what happens in November and I hope that's not an unfair question but this is a really big one a really big one so so it's a truly important question um and and I think that this election is going to go the right way and I think one of the big reasons for that when they do the polling the single issue with which Trump is most out of line with the American electorate is over environmental issues, particularly climate change. When they tell people of all the actions he's taken, withdrawing from the Paris Accords turns out to be the one where there's the widest spread between his action and what people want. Um, um, and so I, 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 I think it's gonna be one of the things that the Democrats really campaign around. And I think when they win, uh, we're gonna force them to live up to what they're mm. talking. Um, that may be, you know, whistling past the graveyard. And I will say, I mean, before we get any too optimistic about anything, um, the, the science that we see on a daily basis is, is truly profoundly difficult. Yeah. May, May was the hottest May we've ever had on this planet. And the, the thermometer, particularly in Siberia, was yeah. so out of kilter. And that has such peril uh, for what it means in terms of setting off uh, cycles in the Arctic for which there's no control. I mean, 2020 has been such a terrible year on so many counts that it's hard to remember that it began with all of us watching slightly slack jawed as the continent of Australia burned half to the ground, you know? Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's with one degree rise in temperature. So we're not getting out of this easy. That's not one of the options anymore. Yeah. The question is, and the IPCC, as John points out, has finally given us a kind of happily a sort of time limit. The question is, uh, are we going to use the next 10 years, which appear to be the last period of time we may have really significant leverage over the outcome, doing everything we can to limit how high the temperature is eventually going to go. Yeah. So I, 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 just, I just want to explain. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Sorry, I was just I wasn't sure whether you were with us or, or not here. You are here. <laughs> uh, atypically, Sorry. my internet's been really good for all of these panels. And today. So I I'm going to try and connect on another device. No worries. I, I was I was going to ask. If I may, you guys I was just going to ask Nicole, um, okay. ask Nicole a question about narratives because I, I'm, very, I'm very focused on this and, and, and we're all in the business of writing and storytelling and finding ways of engaging people. And you quite rightly pointed out, Nicole, sometimes we get that right and sometimes we don't. And if you look at it historically, it's a pretty mixed picture. I'm really intrigued to hear though, from you whether you think that the narrative, the, the combined narrative capability of the movement is in a better place now than it's been in the past. Because if Bill is right, and theoretically people are there to be engaged and inspired and enthused 
and we'll come on to the politics, I'm sure, in a moment, activated to take up a more radical politics than they've been inclined to do in the past. That all depends on, on storytelling. And I'm not sure we have changed in that regard. I don't think we have. I think, I think what's shifted, and, and we saw this last year with, with the student movement and with Greta Thunberg, is suddenly that sense of urgency really came back. And there was, you know, we, the, the, the evidence was just too stark to ignore. But where I think we failed, and I think if we don't solve this, we will fail as a movement, is painting that picture of what is the world that we want to create. And I think that fear will only motivate people so far. If they can't see where they're going, if they don't believe that there is really a solution, and frankly, that's not solar panels and green roofs. It's got to be an emotional solution. It's got to be a world that they want to live in, that people believe in, and that feels like a world um, that is a better world than we have now. And I think if you talk to Black Lives Matter on the street, you know, yes, they're outraged about what is happening now, but they also know very clearly what kind of world they want. They want a world where every person, no matter what their race or background, has an equal opportunity to live a good life. I don't think we can frame that yet. I don't think we, I don't think we as a movement have painted that picture well enough. And if we don't do that, um, we won't bring these two narratives together and we won't succeed in, in really shifting the dial. <laughs> I've, I, I've, I've been dipping in and out, but I, uh, and forgive me if I miss you uh, referring to this, but how significant was the news this week that, um, that uh, uh, BP, I think I'm right, is, or is, and Shell are both writing off some of the oil assets they have because they think that they will never be exploited. In other words, that's not black gold anymore. That's black liability. Bill, over to you on that one. <laughs> Look, I, I, I think it's, I mean, I wrote a piece, uh, what, nine years ago now for Rolling Stone called Global Warming's Terrifying New Math that pretty much laid out the fact that, that the fossil fuel industry had five times the reserves of carbon than any scientist thought we could burn. And since then, the question has been, are we going to follow out the storyline they had, they had going then, what they would told their investors and their bankers that they were going to dig up and burn, or were we going to change that story? And if we couldn't, then there was no point even having the discussion. The end of this drama was in sight. Um, that's why it's been so good to see people work first so hard on divestment, and that's really turned into a powerful movement. I mean, I was, uh, the, one of the high points for me this year before the Pope's announcement today was in January when the, the, the chief stock picking guru on American television is a guy named Jim Cramer, who comes on TV every night to an audience of millions and tells them what stocks to buy. And in January, he devoted two nights to just telling everybody, sell your oil stocks. This divestment thing has just gotten too big. There's never going to be serious money to be made in fossil fuel anymore. So that, that was a, 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 a good sign. Um, it's, it's imperative now that we keep the pressure not only on the oil companies, uh, and it's possible that BP and Shell are redeemable, though I have serious doubts. It's clear that Exxon and Chevron and the American companies aren't. But uh, important that we keep pressure on them. Even more important, what we've really worked on in the last couple of years is pressuring the financial community to stop uh, 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 its just endless money pipeline to these guys. In fact, the coalition that a bunch of uh, environmental groups came together on is called StopTheMoneyPipeline.com. And the targets for the last year were BlackRock, biggest box of money on planet Earth, which in January, after fierce pressure, produced a really startling and powerful series of statements about how they were going to have to take climate change as the kind of central issue in their financial planning from now on, and who've begun at least to demonstrate that they meant a little of it in their votes during the shareholder season we've just come through. And the other big target was Chase Bank, biggest fossil fuel lender on earth. There was at the very least a powerful iconic victory two months ago, when again, after enormous pressure, Chase defenestrated its longtime board chair, a man named Lee Raymond, who'd been the former CEO of ExxonMobil precisely in the years when they were pioneering corporate climate denial. So 
the financial community is getting the picture. And to go with something Nicole said, this is another place where these movements around racial justice and environmental sanity merge. There was a report today that Chase Bank, biggest fossil fuel lender on earth, had also lent last year in the city of Chicago 41 times more money into white neighborhoods than black neighborhoods. So I got arrested at occupying their bank in January around climate stuff, and there were people arrested today occupying their bank branches in Chicago around their uh, incredible racism. So this kind of pressure, this kind of change is where it's going to have to come. Yeah. We've got I mean, a, I, can uh, I go just, ahead, Jonathan, and then I've got yeah, a question just, that's uh, coming for you. Totally, totally endorse all of that. And I think it is very significant. And um, all of this in a weird kind of way isn't actually about logic in capital markets. It's a lot about sentiment. And all of these incredibly overpaid, highly intelligent analysts and people in capital markets, they don't just rely on their algorithms. They also rely on this sense that they do not want to be left behind. And there is an emerging sense now that they are on the verge of being left behind as the world chooses to transition to non-hydrocarbon based sources of energy. I just want to say a quick word though, because this wouldn't be happening unless this transition was technologically possible. And um, Bill and I have continued to write um, really enthusiastically over many years about the transformative effect of renewable energy, particularly solar and wind, not just in rich nations, but across the world. And if you look now at the transformative power of solar in particular, but wind coming along pretty soon, I can tell you, uh, in some of the poorest nations on this planet, this is the foundation on which it's possible to build a transformative process for societies to rebuild economies completely. So as we talk about the $10 trillion, which will be deployed over the course of the next uh, six months, next nine months, whatever it is, we need those dollars to be going hard and fast into that energy alternative, including efficiency, by the way, not just renewables, but efficiency, because you get as much of a bang for your buck through efficiency as you do through new energy sources. Let me introduce a thought here that came up in the panel last week, which is all about China. Uh, and all of the panelists pointed out that COVID has been a financial catastrophe for China, and it and the, the knock-on effects will go will are are facing them in the years to come. And one of the bad things to emerge from that is that they are going back to coal and building new coal facilities and so on. How big a factor is that going to be in um, in climate change, and how worried are you about it? Well, very quick, uh, again, defer to Bill here, but very quickly, from my point of view, uh, I'm not particularly worried about that. There's going to be a lot of short-term defaulting to coal. Even Germany did a short-term default to coal recently because it hadn't quite worked out what the transition looked like. China is pretty serious about decarbonizing its economy, as much for air pollution and air quality issues as for climate issues. But for me, this is a story you have to look at from both sides. We would not be in the position we're in today had it not been for China driving its solar industries, its battery industry, electric vehicles, the whole notion of a completely different energy paradigm. We wouldn't be where we are today if they hadn't done all that. And anybody who thinks that we're smart enough to do it in the West, but China's kind of crazy enough to go on burning coal because they think there's some magic in coal which um, everybody else just doesn't recognize any longer, really and truly disabuse yourself of that one. China is as, as keen to get rid of, get out of coal as fast as any nation on this planet. It's got 1.3 billion people, a lot of whom still live in poverty. So yes, it's a little bit stuck for the moment, but don't make too much of this because that's not the issue. Uh -huh. Bill, do you want to add anything to that or Nicole? Nicole? Bill? Uh, well, I'll, I'll look, I think what Jonathan says is right, and I think it goes back to this. I mean, we don't really know how people are going to react, how governments are going to react coming out of COVID. And I mean, the danger is that this is the last moment when the fossil fuel industry retains significant political and lobbying power. It's being weakened by the month because their financial strength, their possibility for growth, all of that is clearly gone. But 
they, they have residual political power and they will use yep. everything within their power to try and make sure that the governments uh, uh, produce bailouts for them instead of uh, sound public policy. Yep. So that's the fight that's going on now and in a certain way. Now, one of the things that's, and I'm curious to get Nicole and Jonathan's sense of this in the UK, one of the things that makes this so interesting and important coming out of this is that we, you know, the, the COVID experience has been so telling in so many ways. I mean, we disrupted life far more than any time we've ever disrupted life in the course of my six decades on the planet in a way that I don't think any the most radical environmentalist could have imagined. I mean, I don't know anyone who's been on an airplane for months. Uh, everyone stopped driving except, I guess, your Mr. Cummings. Um, and, <laughs> um, you know, and still, I mean, the, the good news was, you know, emissions went down 10 or 15 percent. The bad news was emissions went down 10 or 15 percent. Um, and I think we got a strong sense of probably the limits, uh, both the, the power, but also the limits of what kind of individual action is going to do to deal with the dilemma that we're in. It's pretty clear that a huge part of these emissions are very much hardwired into the world around us right now. And we're gonna have to, under, we're gonna have to reach into the guts of the system, pull out the coal and gas and oil, and stuff in a lot of insulation and sun and wind. Now, in a sensible world, the fact that we A, had this existential challenge that we faced that required that, and B, that we suddenly had tens of millions of unemployed people around the world would lead you naturally to the conclusion that this is what we, you know, this is the obvious task for doing the after right now. Uh, the, only, the only thing that interferes with that logic is the continuing political power of the population. And that's why we've worked so hard to try and break it. And that's why things like today's announcement from the Vatican are so important. People need to understand that that is both an impractical and immoral way forward. I, I think one of the things that was interesting about what happened with COVID as well is that these changes happened in democratic societies, that there was, you know, that there was a social consensus um, in support of the need for really radical, drastic action in a way that I think a lot of people thought would only happen in authoritarian states or uh, top-down states. But I think where, you know, where it's also exposed huge weaknesses is the lack of resilience of our societies to protect the weakest in our societies as that change occurs. And I think one of the challenges that we as the movement have to address is if we are going to make these radical changes, which are absolutely needed, how do we do it in a way which doesn't leave the most vulnerable people in our societies behind? And I don't think we have the answer to that. Um, but I think that's where those social justice and environmental narratives really need to come together. And the solutions are the same. They're one and the same. It's not just the problems. It's also the solutions can be the same. But Nicole, just, just coming off the back of that, what's your where do you sit then on the fact that the market has been exposed as a completely inadequate mechanism, social construct for keeping societies intact, for supporting community cohesion, for protecting the things that people cherish in their lives? We've seen the market fail completely through the pandemic and the, the nation state for all its failings has stepped back into the picture and has made things happen that were previously unthinkable, not least the way in which they have um, liberated a, a level of protective financing that wasn't even thinkable before this. So I'm, I'm ambivalent about this. I, I think it's good that the market has been put in its place. I am unnerved by a resurgence of nationalism, some of which seems to speak to a better future for all of us, some of which, whoa, kind of opens up horrendous authoritarian prospects for the future. And I'm finding it really difficult to read that one, I have to admit. Yeah, I think, it, 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 I agree. I think there's a, international structures have been deeply weakened, not just by COVID, but by Brexit, by Trump. Um, and they're in a pretty 
fragile and sad state at the moment. Um, and yet they are absolutely necessary for us to solve global problems. If we don't take action on a global, it doesn't matter how much we do here in the UK or even the US on its own. If uh, China doesn't also do something, if, if you, know, emerging, uh, you know, emerging economic powers uh, don't, you know, or countries with huge populations like India don't also take action. Um, and so I think there is a real danger that we retreat into nationalism um, and into uh, nationalized economies, um, which may have some environmental benefits, um, but that also undermines our ability to take global action because yeah. it, it has to happen on a global level and it has to be through regulation. You're right, the markets on their own cannot solve these mm. issues. One, one small, I mean, this is dark, but also good in a way. Um, you know, the most anti-global uh, uh, idiot leaders in the world also just turned out to be the ones who were completely inept at dealing with coronavirus. So Trump, Johnson, Putin, Bolsonaro. Um, um, and one can't help but imagine that their political standing is weakened by their utter failure to be able to come to grips with the coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we... we I can't help but notice that we, we in the UK spend quite a lot of time trying to position ourselves as world leaders in utter political dysfunctionality. And we know where else we need to look in terms of President Trump and Bolsonaro, but boy, it's a pretty, pretty painful league table to be competing in, I can tell you. I, um, I'm going to go to a question now. Uh, this is, oh, it's from Anonymous. Um, it's an honor to have the opportunity to hear the inspiring panelists. Uh, building on Jonathan's comment on the lack of legal NGO action in Europe on environmental issues, how uh, can we help to make sure that the laws that already exist uh, are actually enforced? That a big part of the problem is that uh, the, the laws are simply uh, honored in the breach. Yeah, this is a big one for both our countries, if, if I may, for the moment, for, for the UK and the US. And it, it remains deeply disturbing. Bill will comment on this, of course, that President Trump is still intent on rolling back some of the absolutely basic foundations of environmental law in the USA um, with, a, with a, an astonishing level of determination to use his four years to dismantle pretty much the entire edifice. We are equally worried here in the UK because once we're out of the EU, a lot of the foundation on which our environmental law is built, namely the EU-based directives and standards, will no longer obtain here in the UK. And it is perfectly possible to envis envisage a significant diminution in the environmental legal protection that we've taken for granted for a long time. So this is absolutely right. This is core stuff. We have to protect that. So I really admire organizations like Client Earth that is fighting a legal case to ensure that governments can't undo the gains that have been made over the last few years, fighting to stop new coal in countries like Poland and so on. And I really admire a bigger global campaign called Stop Ecocide, which is seeking now to put the whole notion of crimes against the planet, crimes against the non-human bits of life into the International Court of Justice to be prosecuted alongside other crimes against humanity. We need these legal protections. We need these uh, absolutely fundamental opportunities for people and communities to use a legal system to help protect themselves and the interests of future generations. It's a big deal. It's happening at the moment at a speed that I think we, I find it quite hard following how quickly some of our environmental safeguards are being dismantled. I've got another question here. Um, that is, I can't help feeling that we're all going to go back to business as usual. Um, concerned people are talking to one another in an echo chamber. I just don't have your optimism. Boris Trumpson is a product of our system. Uh, do you really think that, that things can and will change? <laughs> I think they can change. I think you know, Black Lives Matter shows that. I mean, look how quickly in the US there has been sort of, you know, the adoption of what even six months ago would have been seen as completely beyond the pale ideas um, that are suddenly being talked about seriously and adopted at, at, a, at a sort of astonishing pace. 
you know, that change is possible, but I think only if, if we demand it. And, you know, and I think we have, yet, personally, I feel that we have yet to find the language and story that will really inspire that kind of people power, um, certainly here in the UK. Um, and, you know, we need to think about how we bring, you know, that's why it is so essential to bring these, these movements together so that it is about building a better world in all sorts of different ways, a better world, a more just world and a more sustainable world. Bill, what happens if President Trump wins a second term? Where are we then? Well, we're screwed. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, that's a, I mean, look, four years of Trump has been extremely bad news. Um, it was an enormous, you know, in, in climate terms, we came out of Paris with a certain amount of momentum. And, and it was, you know, to, to make Paris work required not only that we go down that path, but that we accelerate dramatically down that path. And Trump's election and Bolsonaro's election constituted massive speed bumps uh, on potholes, craters almost in that road mm -hmm. that slowed us down, robbed that momentum. Um, and it's just conceivable that we can regain it, that we can push hard uh, if we beat Trump and, you know, but if we don't, four more years of Trump, I mean, that's effectively taken the U.S. most yeah. of the way to that 2030 uh, goal line, you know, yeah. um, um, and, 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 and this, believe me, the second Trump term will be even worse than the first. Uh, he's already, as Jonathan and Nicole point out, rolled back every environmental law that he can. But four more years to appoint all the judges in the U.S. means we'll never uh, do anything. That, that kind of, so, so this is, uh, uh, in that sense, an all-or-nothing election uh, in the U.S. And given the U.S.'s uh, role as the biggest carbon emitter historically in the world, what the U.S. does necessarily matters a lot in in how the world comes to think about and work. Yeah, and so all we're all, we're all looking to you, Bill. That's for sure. Bill, I have a question. How how seriously do you think the Biden the, the Biden campaign and Biden are taking these issues? Because you know Biden himself and the people I know in that circle are not you know not what I would call on the on the sort of radical side of the environmental movement. No, um, no. Um, they're not. So what's interesting in, in American politics this time is watching the play of the, I mean, the Democratic Party is clearly undergoing a kind of uh, uh, split here or a kind of change. And among young people becoming far more progressive and their standard bearer was Bernie Sanders. And now the party's kind of trying to work out where it's, you know, how to accommodate that. So there's a panel, I mean, the job that I did in 2016 to try and kind of uh, bring the Biden viewpoint into the Clinton Dem Democratic Party, now the people are doing the same thing. There's a panel set up uh, between uh, some people that Biden appointed and some people that Bernie appointed to try and reach a kind of platform. And I think that that works going pretty well. And I think Biden will be campaigning pretty hard. But the real point is that the reason you elect someone like Joe Biden is not because they're going to change everything. Mm. It's because you can pressure them into changing, if not everything, then a lot of things. Our problem with Trump is that there's no point in mounting campaigns. Yeah. I mean, there, there's no way to organize against him. He's not, you know, uh, 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 th there's no possibility there. So, I mean, I helped organize the largest demonstrations against the Obama-Biden Obama administration when they were in power. And it was over this Keystone Pipeline fight that became the kind of um, birth of the fight against large fossil fuel infrastructure around the world. And, it, you know, it, Obama didn't give it to us. We had to fight for it, but we got it, you know. And, and, and so I'm, uh, that's why I'm very hopeful that we can elect Biden so that then we can go to work. We haven't really been able to do that work the last four years. You know, at best, we've been working at the state and local level, and that's good, but it doesn't come close to meeting yeah. speed demands. Uh, that I, I want to really, I, I want to row in behind that, Bill, because it is so important. And there was an extraordinary moment, Nicole, I'm sure you noticed this in 2019, where 
the Sunrise Movement, a, a really interesting young activist movement in the USA, occupied Nancy Pelosi's office and basically said, you're not fit for purpose any longer. The Democrats, as they've seen climate change, have failed completely in their historical duties. Now you're going to have to step up or you're going to have to step away. And I do think we continue to underestimate the role of young people in a new generation of radical political action, which I think is absolutely crucial to me. If there's any hope in this hellish prospect that we seem to be carving out for ourselves, and if a I, lot of it if resides. If I can brag on those young people for just a minute, Jonathan. Sorry? If I can brag on those young people for just a minute, the young people in the Sunrise Movement who brought us the Green New Deal, yeah. occupied Pelosi's office and found Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to be their champion, they're all the veterans of the fossil fuel divestment movement. Yeah, I know. I know. The graduates, they fought to divest their campuses. And now we see, to Nicole's point, this magnificent explosion of even younger energy, junior high school and high school students around the world. Greta is fantastic. I love her and I've been a great pleasure to get to know her. But the real good news is there's 10,000 Greta Thunbergs around the world and they're all articulate, competent. I mean, they, you know, they know as much or more than I do about climate change. The only thing that worries me sometimes is that they're so good, so strong, um, that other people are just going to take the biggest, you know, problem the world ever faced and, and offload it onto the shoulders of 14-year-olds to solve. We can't do that. We have yeah, to well. have inspiration for adults to get to work in a serious way. Yeah, but There's Bill, you and I have both been described as veterans, so you know exactly what we have to do, and you keep doing it. And that's literally, we have a historical obligation, so just suck it up, as we know. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about UK pol the context of UK politics and combating ch climate change as we come out of COVID. And let me tuck in a question here that came in. Uh, the UK is going to uh, host uh, COP26 next year. What should it seek to achieve? <laughs> so we've got this uh, window of opportunity, COP26, deferred from November 2020 to November 2021. Um, actually, I was mightily relieved when the decision was taken to defer COP26 because our government, the Boris Johnson government, was wholly unprepared for doing what needed to be done and actually still today is wholly unprepared for doing what needs to be done by the end of next year. It is staggering just how incompetent they are in terms of organizing what will undoubtedly be the single most important moment in the international diplomacy around climate change. Between now and then, we will see these recovery programs kicking in all around the world. To a certain extent, COP26 for me has become the point at which we either mark the massive change that has happened in the global economy, because we've decided to do the right thing from an economic and social justice perspective and to do it via a climate lens, or if we haven't done that, COP26 at the end of 2021, I can't actually see much point in having it. If the $10 trillion haven't gone the right way into rebuilding our economies, rebuilding nature, creating a stable climate, creating opportunities for young people and social justice, then all we'll have is another wretched circus at the end of the year with governments continuing to play fast and loose. At that point, radical politics for me becomes the only mechanism by which we'll actually get change in political systems here in the UK and in many other countries around the world. And that, that is the biggest conclusion I come to in in Hope in Hell in the book is that without mass civil disobedience, we're very unlikely to bridge the gap between what the science tells us should be happening and what actually is happening at the moment from a political view. And, and Bill, I've re you know, I loved Falter and I read the conclusions that you came to, which were, sorry if I've, I've just simply followed down your line here, but pretty much the same. The gap between the science and the politics is so big, you've got to think of a different kind of political intervention to narrow that gap. But why do you have any hope at all that the 10 trillion is going to be directed into the right solutions or building you know, the, a new and correct matrix? Who's gonna lead that? 
uh, nation states don't have much of a, an incentive, and certainly not the one in America, Bill, and certainly not the one here, Jonathan. Well, I, 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 I would never speak on behalf of what might happen in the US, but I, I don't feel quite as bad about that. And I'd be really interested to get Nicole's reflection on this. I don't feel as bad about that here in the UK. I, okay, we have a, a, a really, a, a government that is massively incompetent, but we do have a chance of the exchequer who's quite smart. And there's no particular downside to, to doing this recovery program in a genuinely sustainable way. You get all the same upsides that you want, jobs, skills, opportunities, purchasing power, reflation on a constituency by constituency basis, pursuing the built environment, sustainable transport, a conservation core going back to, as Bill was saying, a kind of new deal, green new deal type idea. There's no downside to this. You get the jobs and you get wealth and you get the multipliers, the economic multipliers, you simultaneously get the kind of benefit that we need from a climate point of view. I, I feel perhaps a little bit more confident and hopeful about that than clearly the question of that feels about it. I don't know, it seems possible. I think there's, you know, I think the government here in the UK talks a lot about their green credentials, while at the same time continuing to use foreign aid money to subsidize uh, oil and gas abroad. Yeah. And I think there's a real danger that, you know, yes, in a sane world, um, you would have a sustainable recovery for COVID-19, but there are all sorts of other interests that, um, you know, businesses and industries that are, are behind the scenes lobbying for things to, you know, the money to come to them. And I think at the moment, I don't see the real sustained pressure for that, um, you know, for that sustainable transition in a, any visible way. And I think, you know, we have to figure out how to make that, that noise, we have to mm. be noisier about that. Otherwise the government won't feel any pressure to do that. Um, just one big one, if I may, one just qualifier on that. The role of business this time around is completely different. All the advocacy coming from leading companies now in Europe, all the advocacy that is out in the public domain, you're right, a lot of it is going on secretly behind the scenes, but the public domain advocacy is all in favor of rebuilding our economies on this basis. That business voice is absolutely critical to persuading the EU and European governments to do the right thing. And it's actually pretty pronounced in the US as well. I mean, there's been phenomenal statements of support from big US-based multinational companies. Well, what do you think? Push the, push the banks like hell. Um, um, <laughs> bankers um, have a great deal of uh, responsibility for the fix we're in, and they have a great deal, you know, where capital flows go will eventually tell the story here. Yeah. And if they think that there's no more money to be made in fossil fuel because because we're going to make their life we're going to you know these movements are just going to keep building and making this case harder if they come to believe that then it will be hard for the fossil fuel industry to do what it wants to do you know when we got ready for bailout time in the states this year the uh coal industry wrote to congress saying uh, we need a bailout because the divestment campaign has made it impossible for us to raise money on our own. Uh, Shell last year uh, in their annual report said that this divestment stuff has become a material risk to our business, which is good because their business is a material risk to the planet. But it's a reminder that in the end, you know, one of the, the there's two big levers to pull here, two levers big enough that they might make a difference. One is the political lever. We got to work every government that we have as hard as we can. But even at their best, governments work fairly slowly. The other level lever is the financial lever. And you know, the the that's hard. I mean, we're going up against the you know pillars yeah. of the global financial system. It's not easy. But if you can actually pull that lever, then A, it happens fast you know, BlackRock says something and the stock market changes 20 minutes later. And B, it happens pretty much everywhere around the world at once. Look, Washington or London don't rule the world anymore and for the best, uh, but Wall Street and the city, they still kind of do at 
some level or another. And so this is a really effective locus for activism. And it's not a place where we put as much pressure as we should have in mm -hmm. the past. And I hope that we'll continue doing that because I think increasingly we're pushing on a kind of open door here. We just need them to, I mean, here's the, here's the basic bottom line. Everybody knows that 50 years from now, the planet's gonna run on sun and wind because economics. But if it takes 50 years to get there, every scientist knows that the planet that runs on sun and wind will be a broken planet. So basically the job description of climate activists is to figure out how to speed up that transition dramatically. And one of the most important ways to do it is to do what Nicole is talking about, to make it clear that this is in the interest of absolutely everybody, especially the poorest and most vulnerable people on the planet, because the absolute iron law of climate change is the less you did to cause it, the faster and the harder you're going to suffer from it. So that's why building these big coalitions uh, and, and, and working across issues is so crucial. We're up against the same rotten power structure and we can make it change if we push hard enough, but that's the question. Can we push hard enough? Jonathan, if, if I can just respond to what you were saying too, I think you're right. There are a lot of companies out there that are doing the right thing and genuinely want to change, but there are also are whole industries that are possibly unsalvageable or have no place in a modern economy and they will fight tooth and nail to 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 stay alive in the short term and i think there's also a lot of well-meaning companies that um you know want to do the right thing but are still still not ready to take the fundamental root and branch changes uh, that they will need in order to make their businesses sustainable so i think you, you're you're right businesses are definitely singing a different tune and it's a much more positive tune and i think in some ways they are ahead of, of where governments have been but i maybe i'm too much of a cynic to to believe that you know that um we should sort of put too much faith in that i think we have to continue to hold them to account. yeah yeah no that's that's not that's not cynicism that that's that's realism that that is that is well based in terms of the history of how corporate lobby has changed public policy primarily for their own benefits rather than for the benefit of society or public outcomes so that's i don't call that cynical i call that extremely realistic but but, the, but it does it, it is important that one marks the degree to which the the gauge changes the sort of mood changes and I, I just know that when you can talk to a government minister and what you're saying is replicated by leading businesses in the next meeting they're having, it does count for something. And I don't, I don't want to take away from that business leadership because boy, do we need it. And actually I'm completely with Bill on fossil fuel companies and banks. They are the go-to targets now for Extinction Rebellion. And for whatever happens when the direct uh, action, the nonviolent direct action movement kicks back in again post COVID, because don't forget that hasn't gone away just because it went disappeared at the start of 2020. None of that energy, that radical campaigning energy has gone away. It is still there. Extinction Rebellion has not gone. And for me, it's really important to shift the focus now onto precisely as Bill was saying, onto sources of capital and onto those companies who have been beneficiaries of that capital, often reinforced by public subsidy, because the sheer utter scandal of billions and billions of dollars of public money going into these fossil fuel companies on top of everything else is just, it is, remains for me unbelievable, unbelievable. We're getting close to the end of our time here. I did have a hand up from Ian Rickard. Um, are you still there and do you still want to ask a question, Ian? While you think about that, um, uh, we had another question. Ian. Oh, good. Okay, yes, yeah, speak up then. Oh, hi. Well, it's, the question is about the ordinary consumer. You get consumer power, uh, can do a lot. I'd just like to know what you know, your, uh, what you think we, the ordinary consumer can do to shift these paradigms and how we can get them to do that because you know, purchasing power is important. But a lot of people are busy, they're stressed, 
lot of them are unsure and confused. And so getting them to shift their purchasing behavior, especially when that might cost more money and take and be more complicated is a challenge. But it's a challenge that I think has to happen. I think okay, you thought thank you very much. Practical advice from the panel. I mean, I think in, in some ways it's, it's people have to, you know, people's purchasing choices are a vote. Um, and it's as important that people are noisy about those choices, whether that's tweeting or sharing with their friends as what those choices are. I mean, I certainly found um, when plastics was the issue of the day in, in the UK, that that was the thing that really got companies scared is because suddenly they felt their consumers were caring, you know, cared about that. And suddenly I was at WWF at the time and we had all these companies coming to us saying, you know, tell us how to fix this problem. We know we've got to fix it. Um, so, you know, I think it, it, the reality is, is you cannot be, a, you, you can, as a consumer, there's no way to be an entirely environmentally conscious consumer because the system just doesn't exist unless you're gonna grow all your own food and live in a yurt. Um, but you can be noisy about the choices you do make and that sends a really powerful signal to companies and to government about what is acceptable behavior. I, 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 I sort of would like to come at this question a bit differently because I get terribly worried about thinking that there is a individual consumer led appropriate response to the global crisis that we're facing um, for every consumer who does decide to do the right thing for him or herself and decides to look at their travel patterns, their diet, to eat less meat, to fly less often, to ensure that any pensions or any investments they might have are knowingly invested in things that don't destroy the planet, all of that kind of stuff. I, you know, I, I've supported those individual consumer campaigns for the last 50 years and I will go on supporting them. But do not think that is what is going to rescue humankind from the trap that we have dug for ourselves. That will only come about by concerted international cooperation about changing the rules of our economy. Within this economy, as it is currently constituted, no amount of responsible individual consumer action will actually shift the needle. So my recommendation is get involved in politics. I know that's not comfortable for a lot of people because they'd like to think that you can do it via good, caring, consumer-based responses, but trust me, you can't. You have to get involved in politics as well as doing all those good things. Yeah, I, I just want to follow up on what Nicole and Jonathan were saying. Look, stay out of your car, stay off the airplane. Now you've all figured out you can use Zoom and it works fine. Um, but the most important thing an individual can do is be a little less of an individual and join together with others in movements large enough to shake things up, whether yeah. it's Extinction Rebellion or uh, Fridays for the Future or 350.org or whatever it is that's actually pushing hard to make systemic change. That's how we get change. What we should take from what's happening in the US right now around racial justice is that zeitgeist change happens rarely, but it happens when there's a confluence of two things, big visible events like someone getting murdered on television and great underlying organizing that allows that to mean something, to be taken advantage of. We, we have increasingly that confluence in the climate movement. Look, mm -hmm. by now Mother Nature has made it abundantly clear what this is going to look like and around the world we're beginning to see it. And we have a growing, growing, growing movement. We just need it to be bigger because we have to take down the single richest, most powerful industry that the world ever saw. And we have to do it in a matter of months. Bill, I, I agree. I'd add one more thing to it. I think it's a rich ecosystem of ideas so that when, when the right moment comes, those ideas can come come to the top. And I think that's one of the things that worries me about the environmental movement at the moment. I'm not sure we've got a, a big enough, wide enough, radical enough ecosystem of ideas out there. More ideas, please. Nicole, write some more books. Jonathan, write some more books. Everybody get to work. Bill, write some more articles. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you all very much. I've learned a great deal and it's just been such a pleasure to ask questions to you and hear your learned and uh, inspiring answers. 
Thank you very much indeed once again from me and from the Frontline Club, and thank you to everybody who joined us online. Goodbye. Thanks, Cheers. Elizabeth. Bye, everybody. Bye.